from the previous section, we've looked at how an ecosystem is going to be influenced by its latitude, as well as by the precipitation and presence of topography, and that the ecosystems are going to fall into different biomes. What we're going to be looking at in this section is how energy flows throughout the ecosystem. In this case, this is in the southwestern area just to the northwest of Lubbock, Texas, and we can see that there's a tarantula eating a beetle. Um, the beetle had already been killed and I couldn't really tell what kind it is, but we definitely see that the tarantula is getting its energy from consuming the beetle. And energy is going to flow in a similar manner regardless of what organisms are involved. <laughs> the initial sun is going to fuel all of the energy for the planet. It's going to be taken in by primary producers. These are plants generally that are going to perform photosynthesis and convert that solar energy into sugar or chemical energy that then organisms on the planet can use. Primary or first level consumers are going to be the herbivores and these are going to be the organisms that eat the grass or whatever the other plant may be. Excuse me. Secondary consumers or second level consumers are generally going to be carnivores that eat herbivores, although they can also be omnivores that will sometimes eat herbivores and will sometimes directly eat plants themselves. Then we get tertiary consumers or third level consumers, which are carnivores that generally are going to eat other carnivores, although sometimes they will eat herbivores. We can also have a quaternary or a fourth level consumer, but it's not shown on this pyramid. And one thing that you notice in this pyramid is, well, that it's shaped like a pyramid, that it's more narrow at the top than it is at the base. And this is done intentionally. A pyramid is used with design because for each level, as you go from producer to primary consumer to secondary consumer, consumer, only one-tenth of all the energy that had been available at the previous level is transferred to the next level. So the thousand units of energy present in the plants translates only to a hundred units of energy at the primary consumer level. That in turn only to ten units of energy as you get to the secondary consumers and a mere one unit of energy excuse me, when you get to the tertiary consumers. And so you can see that within an ecosystem, a very large number of plants and primary consumers can be sustained, but only a small number of tertiary or top level consumers can be sustained just because there won't be enough energy reaching them if there are too many. So there are different ways to graphically depict this flow of energy. One is a food chain and this is a pathway from the primary producers through the various energy levels. And what it is is one potential pathway for the energy to follow. A food web is more involved and it's going to show multiple potential paths that in which that energy can flow rather than limiting itself to just one chain. And one very important component of any ecosystem, but one that was absent from that pyramid, are the detritivores and the decomposers. These are the organisms that are going to break down the dead plant life and animal life, and while that sounds a little, well, gross, it's, it's important. If detritivores were not there to break remains down into smaller pieces, they would stay large and intact. And if decomposers were not to chemically break them down to restore those valuable nutrients into the soil, we wouldn't have viable productive soil in which the next generation of plants could grow. And if you uh, watch the video, uh, sorry, watch the slides through PowerPoint, you can click each of the blue links to watch various processes of detritivores and decomposers in action. Uh, some of them are a little gruesome, but it's pretty amazing. The uh, monitor lizard and the fox decomposition in particular are a bit graphic, but very cool. 
and some pretty neat fungus or fungal growth in the side on the decomposers. So an example of this energy flow. We have here a chain represented rather than a web because it's just showing one potential path. We're noticing again that 10% transfer or 90% loss at each level. This is a highly inefficient process and so you may be asking where did all that energy go? Why does only 10% make it to the next level? And that's because of well, friction, body metabolism, and various stages in which heat is lost and in which the energy is converted from that stored sugar energy into another form of energy. It's used for motion. It's put off as heat. It's transferred into another form, which is then no longer available as an energy source to the next level. So similarly, pause the video and when you're ready, advance the slide. So hopefully you realize that four and five are both possible. Considering that the hawk could eat the mouse, which is at a lower level, it would only be at the third stage or tertiary consumer. But if it ate the snake, which had eaten the mouse, then it would be a quaternary consumer. And Sometimes a, an ecosystem can sustain a larger number of potential consumers because they will fit different roles at different times. A population in which a hawk was exclusively bound to eating snakes would not be able to hold as many hawks or sustain as many hawks as it can when they can also feed on mice or other secondary consumers. And biomass. Oh, I'm sorry, I have already done this, but 10% goes on, the rest is expended in cellular respiration, or digestion is also an inefficient process, and some of that energy will be lost in their feces or when they defecate. And of course, along with your detritivores and your decomposers are also many species of coprophages, and those are animals that feed exclusively on dung or feces. And so a couple of questions to consider. Pause the video for a moment while you think about them and then continue and I'll discuss um, my opinion on these. So vegetarianism, very vegetarianism is more energetically efficient than eating meat because we lower ourselves to a lower position on that food pyramid and make more energy accessible to ourselves when we consume plant matter rather than consuming animal matter. If we eat, say, a burger, the cow ate the initial plants and only 10% of the plant matter went into the cow and now we're receiving only one-tenth of that or one one-hundredth of the initial energy we have lost 10% of the possible energy available to us by eating the cow rather than the plants themselves. And big fierce animals are rare because, well, big fierce animals eat smaller, less fierce animals, which are less efficient um, energy sources than our plants. So as you recall from that pyramid, at the top, you can only have a small number of top level consumers because there just simply isn't enough energy reaching them through their prey animals as would be if they fed lower on the system. And we see this graphically represented in the series of pie charts. Each time again because of cellular respiration, because of digestion, because of various inefficiencies throughout um, just biological life, only 10% is converted to the next phase. 90% each time is lost as heat. And if you remember from Bio 101, heat is not a source of energy that uh, biological organisms can feed on. We need heat to keep warm, but we cannot feed on heat, and neither can any other animal. And we can see different ways in which this occurs in uh, different ecosystems. We have the large base pyramid, which is the typical one that you would think about in 
any of the uh, grasslands or forest areas that we're most familiar with. You have a large base of producers and a very small top of that pyramid with a small number of top consumers. In a small base period, really, sorry, pyramid, you're really looking at exactly the same thing, but just a smaller number of organisms because you have a less hospitable environment. This would be places like deserts, whether it's a hot or a cold desert, tundras, open ocean, places that just can't sustain as much life or in which life is far more heavily distributed. Occasionally, though, you get the inverted pyramid. And this tends to happen when you have a very large organism as your primary consumer. So whales, for example, baleen whales eat plankton and primary producers, which are themselves microscopic, yet the baleen whale is extremely large. So you get a huge amount of biomass just because the whales themselves are so large, even though you have a small number of individuals. And same thing, pause the video and when you're ready, advance it. And hopefully you realize that the salad would be the most efficient because it's the only plant life that you're eating. Even if you eat the ice cream, which is not directly an animal, the animal, the, usually the cow, but I guess occasionally a goat or whatever, um, is needing to produce the milk to base the ice cream upon, and that is less efficient. And so this is the end of part two, and when you're ready, continue on to the next video.